The countries around the world have largely held the line against further setbacks in battling malaria. That's according to a new report released by the World Health Organization, which also shows a drop in global deaths from the disease. An estimated 619,000 fatalities were recorded in 2021, compared to 625,000 in 2020. The figure stood at more than 560,000 in 2019 before COVID-19. Infections, however, continue to rise in 2021, though at a slower rate than during the first year of the pandemic. WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus says he's hopeful of a malaria-free future and believes countries affected will be able to get the disease under control through strengthening their response, mitigating the risks, and accelerating research. To bolster its capabilities to fight the illness, the UN Health Agency has called for more funds. It says investments to tackle the disease should be doubled warning that the world is currently off track in reaching its goal of reducing the number of cases and deaths by 90% by 2030. Now, the stakes are particularly high in Africa, which accounts for 95% of cases and 96% of deaths from malaria. But for more insight on the report, let's speak now with James Beeson. He's head of a Malaria Immunity and Vaccines Laboratory and deputy director of the Burnett Institute. He joins us this morning from Melbourne. Uh, James, you know, a slower rate than during the first year of the pandemic, but still pretty worrying numbers in terms of the increase in cases and deaths caused by malaria. What's your take of the latest trends in malaria control and elimination across the world? Yes, that's right. You know, the, the numbers, you know, there's some good news in the numbers. Um, we saw that when the pandemic hit, um, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, numbers of the malaria cases and deaths, as you highlighted, went up in 2020. Um, and in 2021, you know, we're seeing things relatively stable. Uh, the number of cases has gone up a little bit. The number of deaths has gone down a little bit. So there's some good news in that. Things haven't got worse again. However, we've still got higher numbers of cases. That's the number of people who are getting sick from malaria and higher numbers of deaths than we had in 2019 before the COVID pandemic hit. So, you know, the WHO set a target of reducing malaria, eventually eliminating malaria and reducing malaria by, um, you know, a substantial amount by 2030 and compared to the 2015 numbers. And we're really not on track to achieve that. We've seen overall really no um, reduction in global malaria burden um, since about 2015. Uh, James, one of the key lines of defence against malaria has been the use of insecticide-treated mosquito nets. But this report found that they're declining in effectiveness. Why is that? And what needs to be done in terms of resistance management? Yeah, that is proving to be a big issue. Um, using in, um, bed nets treated with insecticides and to some extent spraying of insecticides indoors um, has really been an important strategy in preventing malaria because malaria is transmitted through the bite of mosquitoes. What we're seeing, though, is for a number of reasons that um, is becoming less effective, and that's for several factors. One is that the mosquitoes themselves are becoming resistant to the, the insecticides that we're using. Mosquitoes are also changing their behaviour so that they're biting people when they're not protected from um, mosquito nets, uh, not sleeping under mosquito nets, for example. And we've also seen changes in the distribution of mosquitoes, there's concerns about mosquitoes transmitting malaria in urban or peri or semi-urban areas, which generally hasn't happened a lot, um, you know, over the years. So those sort of changes are really impacting on that really important strategy of preventing mosquito bites. Mm -hmm. So we definitely need new tools or new strategies, um, such as highly effective vaccines, to really bring in another, you know. Um, a strategy that we can use to really reduce the burden of malaria globally. Yeah, speaking of vaccines, James, we are expecting a vaccine against the disease to begin rolling out uh, next year. We also hear it's only 30% 
effective and requires four doses. And what's taken so long for this to be developed? And why does it seem to be sort of a, a poor cousin of COVID vaccines? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think that's become something that a lot of people are asking now is, you know, how did we get a vaccine for COVID so quickly? And yet for malaria, it's been decades and we still don't have a highly protective vaccine. So they, this vaccine is starting to roll out in, in areas with a high transmission of malaria. And at the moment, it's, it's just been um, implemented for young children and infants. Mm -hmm. And it has protective effect of about 50% in the first year. But when it's given um, over with four doses over three to four years, then the protective effect is only in the 30% or so. So it, the main issue is that for COVID vaccines, there was just one, what we call protein, one specific part of the virus that the vaccines target. So it was relatively straightforward um, to make a COVID vaccine. For malaria, there is dozens or hundreds of different proteins or what we call targets. There's many, it's a much, much more complicated organism, many, many times more complicated than a virus like COVID. And so this complexity means that it's been really a much bigger task to understand how to effectively make a vaccine that is highly protective. So I think that's an important factor. But we also have to think about, you know, to make an effective vaccine, you know, you need a lot of resources and you need investment financial investment, you need a lot of expertise and capacity. And I think, you know, it's fair to say that there hasn't been enough investment in malaria vaccines to really bring in the best technology and invest in, you know, developing those very highly protective vaccines that we need. Uh, malaria is typically associated with rural areas, but what I found interesting in this report and what you mentioned earlier is that some infective mosquitoes have now adapted to breed in cities in Africa. How at risk are urban populations? Yeah, that, that's really um, concerning, isn't it? So you're absolutely right that we historically, you know, malaria has really been a problem for rural communities mainly. Um, and much less or very, very little in urban areas, mainly because the mosquitoes that trans transmit malaria don't like those urban environments, partly because of pollution and other factors. So if we start to see malaria becoming more established in urban areas, well, that, that could really impact the burden. We could see you know, very major increases in malaria burden if that starts to happen. It potentially might start to... Uh, we might start to see, and we have seen, some increases in malaria in these sort of semi-urban areas, you know, on the edges of cities. So, you know, that's going to be really important for us to find solutions to combat that. I guess, though, that another, the flip side of the coin is that, you know, there are often more resources in cities. You know, people generally have better access to medical care, to diagnostic tests and to treatment. So there are, you know, there is that side of the story as well. Mm -hmm. All right, really appreciate your expertise today, sir. Uh, that was James Beeson, head of Malaria Immunity and Vaccines Laboratory and deputy director at Burnett Institute.